I'd like to welcome everybody here this morning and start off with a prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you very much for this day and for a day when we can come and renew our covenant with you and um, repent of those things that take us away. And Lord, I just uh, pray that you would bless this time together this morning in the Sunday school class that your Holy Spirit might be here and help me, Lord, to uh, be able to convey the things that you've put on my heart and that um, are in your great word. And uh, I pray that you'd also be with the rest of the services and the Sunday school classes that your spirit might attend them as well and that uh, we would be steeped in truth and have a firm foundation for our faith and, and our understanding. And Lord, we just give you the glory for our very lives and for the things that you've provided for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, all right. Uh, today we're starting with Alma chapter 16 and we're just going to do the like the first 77 verses the story of Korahor I feel like the theme that really jumps out from that is the scripture in there that says choose ye this day whom you will serve and I just put a little frame of reference up there uh, this is toward the end of the 17th year of the reign of the judges and when Korahor appears, they've had two years of peace after having, um, you know, all the stories kind of came together with the people of Ammon, the anti-Nephi-Lehi coming to join the Nephites and being settled in the land and uh, a great war for the Lamanites who desired to destroy them and, and the Nephites defended them. And it is a great story of love and let's see, we'll move on. Um, you know, as I, I read through this, um, I, I was drawn to a verse that was actually in chapter 15. And it says, Yea, I know that good and evil have come before all men. Or he that knoweth not good from evil is blameless, but he that knoweth good and evil to him it is given according to his desires, whether he desireth good or evil, life or death, joy or remorse of conscience. And, you know, I feel like that's a foundation thing, and we see that, that good and evil have come before all men. And we do need to choose this day whom we, were, we will serve. And, you know, and according to the laws that King Mosiah had set down and that the people agreed to, you know, there was no law against a man's belief. And so Korahor could believe whatever he wanted, and he was going around teaching false doctrines. Anyway, I thought these two verses were really important to bring out, that good and evil have come before all men, and that how we live you know, is we need to choose. We have to make a choice. So, you know, Alma, this is the first time and really the only time in the Book of Mormon where the word Antichrist is introduced. And, I mean, you can go through a lot of the stories and you can see that if people were teaching against Christ, that is a spirit of Antichrist. But Alma specifically labels it and gives it a name. And I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I, I thought there was just one, one Antichrist. But as I read through the scriptures, you know, in my 20s, I realized that there was the spirit of Antichrist, and I thought it would be good for us to look at what the book of John has to say about Antichrist. In Alma 16, 13 is where we read this. It says, And this Antichrist, whose name was Korahor, and the law could have no hold upon him, no hold for a person's belief. They were only punished for crimes, certain crimes. He began to preach unto the people that there should be no Christ. And in 1 John 2.22, it says, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. And John went on to write in chapter 4, 
Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now is already in the world. And uh, in Second John, it called the Antichrist a deceiver. And so I think um, we could really, we get a good idea that a person who is Antichrist is a liar and a deceiver. You know, First John was after Christ was born. And the book of Alma was way, you know, probably a hundred years somewhere in there before Christ was born. But over and over, we've read through the Book of Mormon that they taught the people to believe in Christ as though he had already come. And even though they kept the law of Moses and all those ordinances, they looked forward to this Christ as though he had already come to them. And so I thought it was worth looking at these scriptures just for that reason. And you know, Korahor, he began in the land of Zarahemla and he went all over the land of Nephi um, or where the Nephites lived and started teaching these false doctrines. And I did want to look at some of what he taught. You know, he taught that um, the people were foolish and he made them question their faith and doubt what they'd been taught, that maybe it was false, maybe they were foolish, and he tried to shame them. And, you know, he attacked their confidence and their mental stability by saying they were of a frenzied mind. But, you know, we know that the Word of God teaches us that uh, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of a sound mind. So in number three, he spread doubt in the word of God and their traditions and teachings and even in their prophecies. Um, he taught that, you know, all of these things were the opposite of having faith, faith in God, faith in prophecies, that they would be fulfilled and what was to come. Uh, he denied the existence of God and Christ. And you know, if there's no God, there's no judgment. There's no atonement. There's no eternal salvation. And he also taught that when you die, you are done. You cease to exist. And, and there's no purpose than in our lives. What would be the purpose of us being here? And I kind of say this, you know, God has a standard of truth. So if, you know, we had a big pole that went up, clear up into the sky, and this is God's standard of truth. And we saw that Nehor took a big step away from that by teaching other things than what Alma had, had taught and what um, the church taught them. And, and then we see that Korahor took that even further away from God's truth to the point where there is no God. You know, at least Nehor believed in God, even if he perverted all the things that he taught. And so, um, you know, under... Under all of these things, you know, the people really began to question whether or not what they had been taught was true. Were they living a lie? And if they listened to Korahor, you know, he began to have success teaching these things. Uh, he taught them there was no remission of sins and that their traditions would lead them away into believing a belief of things that are not so, not true. You know, it's kind of a feel-good religion, or non-religion, actually. You can do whatever you want. There's no consequences. And he also taught that you prospered according to your own genius and conquered according to your strength, your own strength. And when he got to the land of Jershon, where the people of Ammon were, well, they just wouldn't even listen to him. They were so smart. And they tied him up kicked him out of the land and released him, and he went over into another land and started preaching the same things. I think it was the land of Gideon. And they also tied him up. And, you know, I kind of questioned, why would they think they could bind him if he's just teaching his beliefs? But they also had these laws. 
And what he was teaching was it didn't matter what you did. If you wanted to commit whoredoms, that was okay. But they had a law against adultery. And so I think uh, they had grounds for tying him up and taking him to the chief judge and governor of the land and then before Alma, the high priest over all of the church. And I don't know if that helps you or not or if that makes sense or not. While I was reading this, there was a scripture that kept coming back to me from a previous chapter. And it was, it, just a second, Zach. From Zach's class, actually, back in Second Nephi. And he brought up this scripture, Oh, my beloved brethren, remember the awfulness in transgressing against that holy God, and also the awfulness of yielding to the enticings of that cunning one. Remember, to be carnally minded is death, and to be spiritually minded is life eternal. And, you know, as I read through this whole story of Korihor, and you ask yourself, how does this apply to us today? This scripture came back from your class, and you posed this question. And you said, well, what does this scripture mean to you? And, you know, this is one of those scriptures I had read, and it really spoke to my heart. Because so many times, I go on in my own ways. And I don't know about you, it is so easy to be carnally minded. And... Um, you know, when I memorize scripture, this little box over to the side, and, and I say I memorize scripture, I probably couldn't say this or quote this to you without being prompted now, but I'll just take the first letter of each word and write it down, and, and I wanted to take this with me to work, to work on, so I had this little piece of paper, and I was scribbling on it and writing the verse on one side and all of my little chicken scratch on the other, and when I got to the very end, uh, spiritually minded, to be spiritually minded is life eternal, there was this acronym, SMILE. And uh, it made me smile. And, you know, I just wanted us to talk about this a little bit today. Because do we yield to the enticings of that cunning one? Do we gossip? Do we have high-mindedness? So these are things I struggle with. Pride. Speaking over others, meaning uh, not giving other people a chance to talk or always trying to one-up them on a story, giving them the benefit of your experience. Uh, lust, the lust of the flesh, having judgmental attitudes, being selfish, having, living a self-seeking kind of life. It is so easy for us to do that, and it takes a lot to deny ourselves and to really seek to serve others. And I'm going to stop a minute. Zach, you had a comment. Yeah, uh, just, uh, I think um, this ties it up pretty well, but like even on your previous slide, if you, mm -hmm. um, if you kind of look back at that, um, you know, this right here to me just really speaks volumes to a lot of the cultural sin and cultural um, things that we currently deal with. Oh, and yeah. so when we when we think about like, especially like, is the Book of Mormon relevant or is it important today or anything like this, this right here, especially Alma 16, um, you know, we, uh, the, a lot of times we look at the intersection of science and religion and um, a lot of times people will try to go to science to, uh, for their religion and, and then a lot of times, and that doesn't work, <laughs> and so there's no fulfillment in that because it never boils down to the purpose of things. And so what we see is people now really just want to deny the existence of God and Christ just like they did back then. And so we see all of these things playing out just like they did back then, and so it's every bit as relevant in today's society as it was mm -hmm. back then. And we see also that it's very... Like, it is just a cultural, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Maybe not cultural, but this is how people are wired to, mm -hmm. we are wired to... Um, the natural man. Yes, it, like, like the really scriptures say, the natural man is an enemy to God, mm -hmm. and that's exactly 
what we see here. So anyway, so I really appreciate this because this is what makes the Book of Mormon relevant right here. And when we see mm -hmm. things, we're able to just make those easy connections like, whoa, they struggled with this back yeah. then. Well, I have taught Book of Mormon to kids, you know, for several years I did at Oak Grove. And, and I have sat in adult Book of Mormon classes, but I have to say these classes that we've been doing since January have been the best ones that I've ever been in because of that very thing. How does this apply to us and how is it relevant to us in our day? And what, what can we glean from it to help us? Um, I'm going to move on to this one. You know, so Korahor is brought before Alma. And he goes on. You know, he's very puffed up. That's the feeling I get from reading about him. He's had success. And now here's his opportunity to stand before the head guy of the whole church. And if he can shake his faith, why? Well, He's got money in the bag, you know, and so he goes on. I don't know that he says it doesn't really record that he says all the same things that he did in these other cities, but I'm sure that it did. He did because it says he went on with great swelling words. And he also accuses Alma of glutting himself upon the labors of those in the church, you know, meaning that he was being supported by them. And Alma let him rattle on. And he finally came down to where he got to speak. And he just called Korhor out on all these things that he was teaching. And he refutes the claim that they get paid for, their, for serving in the church. But I love the way he says this. You know, what does it profit us to labor in the church? You know, they don't get any money out of this. And he said that he was even spending his own money going on these many trips that he took. You know, he didn't expect other people to pay for that. And neither did any of the other priesthood in the, in the church. And he said, do you believe we deceive this people when it causes such joy in their hearts? And that's paraphrased a little bit. But that was the gist of what Alma was saying. And, you know... When you have an experience with God the way that Alma did, and I don't know how many others of you have had miraculous, amazing experiences where you know that heaven is real, that God is real. And there is no way that this guy was going to shake up Alma's faith. Um, you know, and Alma, I love this scripture. He says, I have all things as a testimony that these things are true all things and he goes on um, I don't know if somebody else would like to read these scriptures verse 49 and verses 54 and 55 I want to say something right before um, yeah. to what you said too when we were in Africa so a lot of people there's a lot of churches in Africa that um, people build con congregations to make money, right? Yeah. It's, it's a job. Mm -hmm. And um, we would go into visit a home and they'd get their neighbors around and we're gonna teach them about the restored gospel. And um, like you'd see some of the teenagers, 20 year olds be like, eh, you know, they're not so much. I remember talking one, I was just going outside and checking the property and talking to some people out there and, and um, they're asking where we're from, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden I was like, do you understand? We don't, we don't get paid to do this. And in, me, when you, when you, in Africa specifically, oh. if you say, oh no, we don't take money to come out here and serve. We're coming out because we believe this and um, we want to share this with you. Immediately changes, like you have someone kind of turned off, kind of putting up borders and walls. And we're like, oh no, we're, we're not paid ministers. We, we do this to serve. And they're like, what? You came all the way across the world to just talk to us about this? We're like, yeah. All of a sudden, they just open up their hearts. Like, they're like, you must have something good then. Like, if you, if you think this is uh, something we're sharing, I'll, I'll listen. And I think that's uh, very important to, to follow what the, what the Book of Mormon teaches on that, to not be, not be paid ministers in that way. 
um, it makes it more authentic, I guess. Oh, I love that. You know, I've even gotten reactions, not to that magnitude because I'm not traveling the distance that you did, but even just in casual conversations with friends at work who, you know, there are a couple, well, there's not now, but there used to be a couple of restoration women that I worked with, but all the rest of them, you know, and they brought up God and their churches and things. Um, you know, every once in a while it would come out, well, we don't pay our ministers. And there is always a shock that you, what? You don't pay your ministers? <laughs> nope. But anyway, I appreciate that. It, it makes it real. It's a sacrifice. Right. And it's a sacrificial love that would take you from here to go to a place that that is... You know, I don't know, but I've heard a lot of things about Africa, and you know, it's not as glamorous and glorious as here, I think in most of the places that people have gone to. It's a sacrifice. And Alma had that sacrificial love. Um, so you want me to yes, read? Yes, now you're gonna read okay. these. Okay. All right, so you want me to read 49 through 55 here? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. But behold, I have all things as a testimony that these things are true, and ye also have all things as a testimony unto you that they are true, and will ye deny them? The scriptures are laid before thee, yea, and all things denote there is a God, yea, even the earth and all things that are upon the face of it, yea, and its motion, yea, and also all the planets which move in the regular form doth witness that there is a supreme creator. And yet do you go about leading away the hearts of this people, testifying unto them that there is no God? And yet will ye deny against all these witnesses? Now, Zach, I'm going to put you on the spot there because you, know, uh, you said something about science. You know, I'm becoming more and more convinced that science really provides tons of evidence that God is real. And, and I, you know... And a lot of people use it to say he's not or have twisted it. But I wanted to know if anybody had any opinions or what evidence do you have that God is real? If somebody asked you, what evidence would you tell them? And does God expect us to have a blind faith? I, I mean, we live by faith, but there's so much that Alma even said is a testimony that there is a supreme Creator, yes. Uh, I've I've kind of been a, a student of uh, philosophy of religion and Christian apologetics for many years, and uh, I would say there is one time when it's not appropriate to just assume that God exists, and that is when you're debating the topic of whether God exists. It's the only time where it isn't safe to just assume that God exists. Mm -hmm. The rest of the time, you can just say, Thomas Aquinas proved that God exists in the 13th century, period. Because uh, this, this, this really isn't a matter of, uh, of, a, of a sort of even public debate. Um, every culture in history uh, that has, uh, every, every society in history that has been on any kind of large multi-generational scale has been theistic. Uh, the only major exceptions are communist in the 20th century and uh, they aren't societies that anyone in their right mind would want to emulate. Mm -hmm. uh, so you might, you, you might, you know, tell an, you know, an atheist, uh, well, Maybe you personally might have some doubts about the existence of God, but as far as uh, building a society is concerned, you haven't managed to even uh, preserve a human society or culture other than communism. Um, and communism has been, you know, horrible. So uh, even if you personally have doubts about the existence of God, you really should be keeping those out of politics. You should have a separation of atheism and state because uh, if we don't, then we, we end up in a, in a horrible situation. And uh, even uh, avowed atheists from the 2000s, like uh, Richard Dawkins, 
are starting to change their minds on some of the things they've said. Richard Dawkins recently came out and said that he regrets what he did to tear down Christianity in the 2000s because he, had, he didn't succeed in replacing Christianity with atheism. Christianity has instead started to be replaced with Islam. And that is because mm -hmm. all things testify that there is a God. And uh, atheism is simply not rational. And even if one generation is persuaded to, to, uh, towards atheism, the next generation won't be. They might not believe in the Christian God, but they're going to believe in some kind of God. Mm -hmm. So the only real debate is which God, not whether there's a God. Yeah. Well, and I think that the huge difference here is truth. You know, it, it has to be based in truth, and we have to have a source of truth. And that's what our scriptures give us. You know, we have something, you know, Korhor had this. He had the scriptures. He was taught, but he was willing to walk away. He didn't discern. I think that's what I need to say. He didn't discern that he was, there's a comment back there, Ivan. Oh, and Zach. I'm sorry, Zach was, you, Zach was first, and you're right there. And then Ivan. I was just going to point out, too, um, you know, I feel like with Korahor, too, he's very knowledgeable, and yes. so he made a willful decision. And so mm -hmm. I think that's also important to denote. Um, the other thing here, I love this, this argument in itself. Um, you know, when you think about the science, the si science can only go as far to explain the how. Mm -hmm. And so this argument here, even as basic as it is, it is a very beneficial argument to point out is, you know, you can't, you can never go as far to, to explain like the why behind any of this. Yeah. And so, you know, when it says here, the Supreme Creator, um, you know, that's exactly right. And so I really appreciate that. And then lastly, this to me also, when God gives us a testimony, it is so important that we share it. And mm -hmm. I, was, uh, I was thankful I was able to convince my nephew that he needs to share his testimony. He just had a, he was really oh, excited. Yeah. He had a testimony. And I, I said, little Zach, when God gives you a testimony, if you don't share that testimony, then what's the purpose of that testimony? Just to make you feel good? And then he was kind of like, oh, okay. I immediately he texted back. He said, I'll share this testimony. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's a step of faith. Yes, it, that's exactly right. To share your testimony right. and even to pray in front of other people. It's a step of faith. And Ivan, and then we're going to move on to the next slide. This is one of my favorite topics and a uh, couple of things I want to point out. Number one, science is, is a man-made creation. All it is is the collection of the measurements that we've been able to make based on questions that we've been able to ask. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people elevate science to this almost, you know, sacred religion. religion. Yeah. yeah. And secondly, for me, for me personally, the evidence that God is real is creation itself. Um, there's something, there's a principle called irreducible complexity, and that is basically that if you take away a part of something, it, it is no longer that something. And so when we look at an organism that has um, sight and digestion and reproduction, you take away any of that, and it's just not, it's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And um, moreover, uh, how did we get a... How did we get consciousness? Where did, where did that evolve from? And so um, there are things that uh, exist that we can't explain. And to me, the explanation is that God made it. Uh, and then lastly, um, the evidence that God exists. Uh, no matter how far into the universe that we peer, and there's new things coming out that the... Um, the James Webb Telescope is finding that they had no idea were there. Uh, they're rewriting the ideas of the formation of the cosmos. And no matter how, how small we look and how many times we split atoms and go for quarks and all these things, there's no limit. We've never found a limit to the creation. And that just speaks to me of, of an eternal, um, immense... Um, 
this yeah. fantastic God. He really is quite amazing. If you go back and you read like 50, 51, 52, and 53, it talks about like Alma questions him and says like, mm -hmm. you know deep down there is a God, but you're making this decision. Right. Whether it's money, followers, power. And so he really, he really kind of just goes straight to his core. And I think most people also, it, we inherently do believe like Ben said, but for some reason, you know, the natural man is an enemy to God. Yeah, uh, you know, I see these similarities, you know, when um, Zeezrom was converted and his, his intention was to trip Alma up and to catch him in something. But the spirit of God was so strong in Alma that he could discern the thoughts of Zeezrom. And also with Amulek, they could discern his thoughts. And you see this same thing, I kind of felt like the scriptures that Zach was talking about, where Alma is perceiving things about Korahor and he calls him out on it, but it does nothing to change his mind, which is really sad. Um, okay, oh, look at this one here. We're gonna go on here. Uh, Korahor denies any evidence for the existence of God. And it also, Zach, this is another thing, a class that you taught in the Book of Alma. And he had a slide up here that said uh, something about the dangers of a hardened heart. And all through the book of Alma, you see this, the dangers being played out of a hardened heart. Um, Alma 16, 50 through 51. Oh, there you go. Um, Alma asks him, believest thou that these things are true? Behold, I know that thou believest, but thou art possessed with a lying spirit. And that's exactly what John said in the book of 1 John. You know, the spirit of Antichrist is a lying spirit and a deceiving spirit. He says, and ye have put off the spirit of God that it may have no place in you. This is what Cain did in the book of Genesis. He cleaved to the spirit that spoke to him, Satan, and he grasped a hold of those things and he put off the spirit of God and God gave him chances to repent and to to come back to him as his son, and he refused. And here we have Korahor, who did the same thing. You have put off the spirit of God that it may have no place in you, but the devil has power over you, and he doth carry you about working devices that he may destroy the children of God. And in 54 and 55, it says, The scriptures are laid before thee, yea, and all things denote there is a God, yea, even the earth, and all things that are upon the face of it and its motion. We don't talk about Satan very much, but he's real. And his desire is to steal, kill, and destroy the children of men, the children of God. And he's very good at it. And when I think of Alma and his dedication to the gospel, you know, in his conversion, Alma went about doing the same thing. He tried to destroy the church of God but his heart was converted and he repented. And from that day forth, he has done everything he could to promote Jesus Christ and a life with God because he knows the joy and the sorrow that you're gonna experience from one from the other. And he was saved from that awful hell. You know, it makes me wonder, it convicts me, what have I done? You know, do I live my life with the goal of spreading the greatness of God and his power to deliver people from their sins? And do I pray for opportunities to share, you know, the testimonies that I have or to share Christ with other people? Uh, you know, or am I just living my life from day to day, content? You know, and I marvel at the book of Alma and the things that he gave up, and also the sons of Mosiah and their friends. There were friends involved in that too. You know, and the last thing that I thought we should talk about in here that really stand out is signs and faith. And you know, Korahor then goes on to say that he's not gonna believe any of this unless Alma shows him a sign. 
And Alma gives him a chance to not do that. And I wonder if somebody would read verse 57. I think this shows the heart of Alma and his desires with Korahor. Now it came to pass that Alma said unto him, that's Korahor, uh, Behold, I am grieved because of the hardness of your heart, yea, that ye will still resist the spirit of the truth, that thy soul may be destroyed. It's just a beautiful scripture, really. Alma was grieved, just like he was grieved at the city of Ammoniah, that this man would not, you couldn't reason with him, and he would not, and he persisted in his way, that he resisted the spirit of truth, and I think Alma grieved for his soul. And I thought that was a beautiful scripture. And so Korahor wants this sign, and Alma says, you know, if you want a sign, it's going to be that you will be struck dumb, never to speak again. And he gives him another chance, you know, are you going to persist in this? And he says, yep, I won't believe unless you give me a sign. And Alma says, do you deny the existence of God? Well, he waffles a little bit there. Maybe I believe in God, but I really don't believe in God. And so, um, you know, he is struck dumb. And I really believe that he was struck deaf as well because the chief judge had to write a question to him for him to read in order for him to write down an answer. And, you know, he confesses that he was deceived, that Satan appeared to him in the form of an angel. And, you know, you, you can go back um, in the book of Nephi and you read where that scripture was that I used before, carnally minded versus being spiritually minded. And if you go back in the verses above that, Alma talks about that very thing, that Satan can appear even nigh unto an angel of light, but that he couldn't discern that what he was being told was wrong. I mean, Moses could discern it, and Jesus could discern it, of course, because he's God. But if we were approached in that way, hopefully our faith is strong enough and our knowledge of the scriptures and our belief and our testimonies that we could discern that we were tr being deceived. Um, in Doctrine and Covenants, there's this beautiful scriptures uh, about signs, people who seek for signs. Um, this revelation, 63, was given after Joseph and Oliver and Sidney had been here for the first time to independence and then they had gone back to Ohio and it says uh, in the description above that um, that chapter or that section that in the infant days of the church everyone was anxious to know the word of the Lord on every subject and this revelation was given about the purchasing of lands it said the people desired to see signs and wonders but not keep all the commandments of God and we're so like that sometimes we don't we want to pick and choose what we believe so I'm going to read through this real quick we're going to run out of time here wherefore verily I say let the wicked take heed and let the rebellious fear and tremble and let the unbelieving hold their lips for the day of wrath shall come upon them as a whirlwind and all flesh shall know that I am God and he that seeketh signs shall see signs but not unto salvation. Verily I say unto you, there are those among you who seek signs. Boy, wouldn't we like to see someone talk in tongues? Yeah. Wouldn't you like to see the elders lay their hands on somebody and they're instantly healed? You know, and I don't know what other signs they were seeking. But, um, and there have been such even from the beginning, but behold, faith cometh not by signs, but signs follow them that believe. Yea, signs come by faith, not by the will of men, nor as they please, but by the will of God. Yea, signs come by faith unto mighty works, for without faith no man pleaseth God, and with whom God is angry, he is not well pleased. Wherefore unto such he showeth no signs, only in wrath unto their condemnation. And this is what happened to Korahor. He was shown a sign, but it it did not bring him to salvation. He didn't even repent. 
And he, um, you know, I love, uh, I put a reference up there, Mark, at the very end of Mark 16, it says, these signs shall follow them that believe. And it talks about, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And so these signs are promises. They're promises that we can claim as faithful believers. Um, you know, I couldn't help but see some of the differences between Alma and Korahor. They both had an experience with an angel, but Alma's angel was an angel from God, and he spoke the truth. And Korahor saw an evil spirit that had the appearance of an angel that taught him lies. And uh, Alma humbled himself, and his sins harrowed up his soul. But nothing like that happened with Korahor. His was to please the carnal mind, and that's why he had success, and that's why he kept teaching. He said, because when he confessed all of this, that it pleased the carnal mind. So uh, the last thing here, you know, the devil, it even says here in, in 1677, and we can see this play out through all the scriptures, all the scriptures, that the devil will not support his children, but rather speedily drags them down to hell. And God, on the other hand, supports and visits his children in their times of need. There's a number of things that are interesting in this chapter one. Korahor said he didn't believe in God, but he, would, he believed an angel. Yeah. And where'd the angel come from? I, uh, I had the same question. Yeah. yeah. It's like, well, you must have believed in something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you and the other thing is it. that um, all of God's creation follows his will. And so going by that uh, hypothesis, then man, if there were no God and the universe was created the way it is, that all things follow a perfect pattern, then man would be carnal continually because he would have no choice. But because man has agency is proof in itself that there is a God because of all the creations of God that, that do his will, you know, and follow his exact will, only man has agency. Only man can make a choice to accept right. or not accept uh, his creator and so in that very in that very fact that that one small creation did not follow a pattern shows that there has to be a creator otherwise man would have no choice but to be continually carnal that's a really good comment i have never thought of it that way before does anybody else would anyone else like to say something scott I believe that God is more concerned in what's going on inside us than what's going on around us. The natural man sees the world and the mm -hmm. things it contain, but God wants us to develop spiritually by praying, fasting, developing a testimony, sharing his love with others, and also that we might always embrace the truth because I think the world gives us mm -hmm. so many misleadings. And I think Korhor was looking for the gains of the world and what man might think of him, not what God thought. Where That's Alma right. was always looking at the inner man developing through fasting, through prayer, and seeking God's mm -hmm. will. It's a constant refocusing, you know, and looking upward instead of, uh, like Elsie was saying, horizontally at what's going on around us. Anybody else? Okay. Um, so... Our assignment for next week is to read the rest of the book of Alma and you know it's the story of the Zoramites and I tell you it's like the same song second verse you know a people instead of just a single person that's Antichrist now you have a group of people that are Antichrist so I Alma doesn't say that I did um, you know if you want make a list of the evidences that you see that God is real and um, I want you to remember, you know, resist being carnally minded because it's so easy for us. And smile instead. To be spiritually minded is life eternal. 
and pray to be an instrument in the hands of God. Pray that he will open your eyes to the needs of those around you. It's amazing what God will bring to you when you pray like that. Anyway, thank you.